why don't you tell me what to preach tomorrow? Because <laughs> you're a mom and you know what they need to know and know, need to hear and so forth. And certainly she gave me some ideas and they're kind of mixed into the mix here for the day. I, I, just, I just sometimes, I, I want to be a blessing for occasions like this because sometimes moms don't always understand how much we appreciate them. I mean, it's a hard job. You guys are really the backbone to society. You're the backbone to the family. You are the backbone uh, to the local community. It's true. Uh, it's because of you women who really have leaned in and gotten a clue about who God is and what's true and right and wrong uh, that we fellas have found our way sometimes to the proper place in society as well. Um, I think of how women do everything. And uh, some time ago, this woman walked into a, um, uh, into a local newspaper because her husband had died and, and uh, she was going to make sure, because she's doing everything, she had to go in and make sure that his obituary was in, uh, properly going to be put into the newspaper. And he, he informed her at the outset, he said, just so you know, it's a dollar a word. It's a dollar a word. Because uh, I guess he gets some lengthy ones. Well, she thought about that for a minute and, minute, and she said, All right, write this. Billy Bob died. <laughs> Billy, Billy Bob died. He looked at her amused because he saw her thrift side coming out. He said, I'm sorry, but they have to, it has to at least be, it has to at least be seven words. <laughs> she thought again. She said, Billy Bob died. Red truck for sale. So she was, so, so she women economize. Women get into the zone of caring about so many things. Uh, so uh, Billy Bob died. I thought that was pretty cool. So, but it is illustrative, isn't it, of how it is with you ladies. You do try to do it all. You try to figure out how to make ends meet, uh, how to be a blessing to your husbands, how to be a blessing to your children. Uh, how to encourage your husband when he's struggling. You know, that happens, doesn't it? When the kids get uh, hurt feelings, and in this day of social media, sometimes it's not just a little bump. Sometimes it's a huge hit. And uh, with the things that they're up against as moms, you now probably are firing on cylinders that most of us have no idea about because young people are subjected to so many sinful pitfalls out there. The kids can be drawn into some of the most nasty places at a very early age. And as mothers, it has got to have you, to some degree, petrified. Uh, the girls are chasing the guys. And the guys don't even have a clue about what to do with the girls because they're freaking out about everything else that they're being subjected to. We are in a society that is in very, very grave danger. And so, for my purposes today, I wanted to take you to a passage that I think maybe at first blush a little bit uh, intimidating because most ladies are already very hard on themselves. But if I can unpack the passage for you a little bit today, maybe it'll be a blessing to your heart as ladies because I want to make it something that is a little bit more digestible for your soul. We're in Proverbs 31 today. And if you know anything about those two words, Proverbs 31, <laughs> you understand that that is... Uh, a thing that puts many ladies' uh, teeth on edge because it talks about the virtuous woman. And most women who read through this passage walk away feeling like, well, I failed. Why even try? Because it's a very uh, lofty view of what the virtuous woman looks like. However, when we look at it today, I hope that I'm able to bring a little bit of clarity to this passage for you. Because if you understand what it is saying in its uh, aerial view and not get bogged down in the details, maybe, just maybe, it will uh, help you to get some, some ground under you that you can say, okay, here's something I can use. I'm going to give you my points out of the gate. This passage, to my mind, seems to break down in three ways, three different sections. Now, there's a couple of ways you can take it. You can take it in two, which talks about the heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, and it talks about how he sits in the gates. And those two passages or those two references in there many times can be used as the way to break it down because she does revolve a lot around her husband. We need to remember that the marriage begins and ends with the man and the woman. The kids are going to go. 
They're going to get up. They're going to grow up. They're going to leave. It's going to be the husband and the wife. So as a wife, if you remember that, it'll help you to have a little bit of an anchor for your own heart and help you not to become overwhelmed by the fact that your kids might get off to the left and to the right. A lot of times, women, when their children begin to stumble, uh, they begin to feel personally uh, culpable. They feel responsible. Their failure then becomes the wife's failure. But in reality, as one woman mentoring another said, just know this, that your son or your daughter is just making their testimony. They're just, God is just developing a testimony for them. Everybody's going to sin. And what you have to recognize is that their failure is their own to make, their, their failures are their own to make, and yours is just to be there and show them grace, Okay. So the one way we could divide it down is about the husband. But what I believe we see, if we back up on it a little bit, if you look at the end of the chapter, it says, uh, verse 31 of chapter 31, it says, Give her of the fruit of her hands, let her own works praise her in the gates. Give her of the fruit of her hands, and let her own works praise her in the gates. You see the word fruit in there, you see the word hands in there, you see the word works in there, and you see the word praise. All of those words have to do with what we're going to see in this passage. And as we break it down into parts, I I think what we're going to see is, first of all, we're going to see her price. Her price, it says in verse uh, verse 10, who can find a virtuous woman? Her price is far above rubies. We're going to look at that. The second thing we're going to be looking at is her perception. Verse 18 says, She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. And then finally what we're going to see is we're going to see her praise, which the Bible says that her children will rise up and call her blessed in verse 28, and her husband also, and he praiseth her. So they're going to see her, her price, her perceptions, and her Praise. All right. So with that said, look at verse 10. It says, who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies. Now, rubies are also uh, kind of connected in the backstory of the word with pearls, roundness. I was thinking uh, about how did they ever come up with um, what was really a good, you know, gemstone and what wasn't. You know, you think about when you were a kid, you're walking through the gravel and you see this really cool stone, you pick it up, you put it in your, I'm going to keep that, that's really cool. Hey, look at my stone and maybe it's a black stone that's shiny. You know, you get that kind of thing going on. But when you began to, uh, when men began to realize there was only very few to be found of something, things, things became precious gems. Uh, And what I want you to know is that the idea of a pearl here is kind of significant. (laughs) Uh, The Bible says a woman, uh, a fair woman who lacks discretion is as a pearl in a swine's snout. So a pearl, that's an interesting word. You see, a pearl is very interesting because a pearl is created out of adversity. Think about that. You know, you get that sand in that oyster, and he begins to put his put whatever juices they're given over that piece of sand. Eventually, it's as time goes on, the irritant becomes a beautiful thing. It becomes a wonderful thing, and so it is with this pearl, uh, this ruby and pearlish ruby, if you will, uh, before us. And it says that who can find a virtuous woman? And when you think of virtue, maybe you do what I you think about what I think about, and that is that virtue has to do with behavior. You know, she has virtue, so that means she's a good person, she's a nice person. Maybe she does things for the poor and so forth. Well, certainly those things are part of it, but really what this word means is this word has the idea of being something of a of a strength. It has the idea of strength. A virtuous woman is a woman who has strength. Now, I referenced this some time ago. Uh, in recent days, probably a few weeks back, um, about the YouTube video that came out about men putting on some kind of an apparatus to simulate going through labor. you got to love that. Now, I'm not going to volunteer. I do believe, however, that my boys might volunteer. No? You wouldn't do that just for fun? Kick no. So, but I, I think Brandon would do it. Do you think Brandon would do it? I think Brandon would do it. Uh, but here's the thing. When you realize that women go through this, and when they have the baby, baby in their arms, uh, it, it, it's all forgotten immediately. And they would do it again. I mean, because these babies are something very precious to them. 
uh, and there's a strength that is spoken to in their soul that, that be, is brought out as a result of motherhood. Women become uh, very, very much uh, strengthened by a child being brought into their lives. I mean, they're doing things they never thought they would do before. They're getting up at all hours of the night. I mean, we got a brand new one in our baby, in our family, and I know that the family's. There was a yawn. I saw that. I mentioned it. She's yawning about that time. She's up all night, you know, because the baby's brand new. If you didn't see it last week, last week when Malaya came, she was in her. That was her due date. She had a shirt on, and she was born like two months before. She was a preemie, and uh, and and the, and the due date. It said due dates are dumb. That's what her shirt said. <laughs> see, she's here. She's been around, so I thought that was great. Perfect shirt for the perfect day, and it was when everybody could appreciate it, all right? Due dates are dumb, and she's just kind of chomping, you know, cruising along. But my point is, is a virtuous woman. Now, when, it, when the word is really dissected, it has the idea of having strength, okay? And ladies, we just want to, I want to just represent the men and say we are amazed at what you do and how you do. You put up with us. If we go through a dark place, you're still standing there smiling. You're still standing there trying to figure out a way to get under us. When the children go through it, most of the time we don't even notice it. But you notice it. And you're watching and you're firing on those cylinders and your heart is breaking for them huh? because you want them to prosper. You want them to flourish. You want them to succeed and you want them to thrive. For the guys, I'm, I'm sorry, we do see it sometimes, but for the most part, we're like thinking, man, they need to just, they'll, they'll get through it, <laughs> you know. But the women are like, oh, I just can't, they can't hurt. We don't want them to hurt. And because of that, when we see what you do in smiling and, and doing your hair and putting on your makeup and, you know, getting up and getting out and getting going and doing it, we just marvel because what's going on in those cases is that inside we understand when we really think about it, there's an earthquake going on down there. And I know that's true. And there's a strength in you that, that staggers us. But it is by design of God that you have that. And when it says a virtuous woman, it doesn't just mean strength. It actually has the idea of being a force. You ever heard somebody say, man, that person's a force to be reckoned with, right? That's you. And you need to realize that it is something you can unlock. It's something you can access because God has wired you to do that. Men is a, are, are completely a different creation of God. Women and men are not the same. I don't care what the world says. It's trying to make us all think we're all the same. It's not the same, huh? And uh, I want to just say to you, we honor you for the fact that you have that pang that goes on. Sometimes you're on the edge of tears, but somehow you just take a deep breath, wipe that little baby away, and you smile and you walk on in there. And that blows us away when we really do think about it. And you're a force. You're a force to be reckoned with. It says that who can find a virtuous woman? It says, for her price is far above rubies. Now, this word price has the idea of worth. And I titled the message, The Worth of a Godly Woman. Now, when I say worth, it's really a misnomer. It's what we see on the front of that word, but the word actually has the idea of being the price of a dowry or a price of a slave. Now, because you and I live in a world, and some of, if you take notes or whatever, this might be helpful as you try to tutor your daughters coming along, because you need to tell them that girls and guys are different, okay? And we need to tell the girls that guys are wired in a certain way to be, you need to be careful. Keep the boy at hand, at arm's length away, because they can't handle being any closer than that. Now, guys, this seems academic, right? Very elementary, but it's not today. Girls do not understand how boys are wired. They don't understand that boys are dangerous in the way uh, of the physical relationship and that they are dangerous for the guy because the guy, you know, he's, he's, he's just a, a mess when it comes to the girl. Look at what Adam did. She took of the tree. She was tricked. And he saw her, and because he loved her so much, what did he do? He took and he ate too. Now, that's huge. That is a, a dynamism that we need to pr uh, kind of pass on to our young ones because they are prone to throw themselves uh, right under the bus for one another. 
in a way, sometimes through ignorance because they don't know what boys are like or sometimes because they're overwhelmed by the sensibilities for the girl. The world is a vulnerable place. And well begun is half done, isn't it? So if we help the girls start well, it'll help them get through this life a little bit better. But when it talks about uh, the virtuous woman, be her price being far above rubies, understand the word price is often uh, kind of used, this word is often used for uh, the price of a dowry or the price of a slave. Now, we bristle sometimes when we think about being servants, don't we? When the words come up in the Bible that says, uh, uh, wives, submit to your husbands, it's like, uh, 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 I don't want to do that. No! Remember what Paul called himself over and over again. A bondservant of Jesus Christ. Remember what Mary said when she was told that she would conceive in her womb and that thing would be conceived of the Holy Spirit and it would be the Savior and he would be, Christ, he would be named Christ and he would save his people from the sin. She said, behold, the handmaid of the Lord. You see, the disposition of the believer is a servant. And when you understand that her price is far above rubies and you understand that it has the idea of a dowry on one hand but it also has the idea of being a slave on the other you begin to uh, realize why her price is so valuable because she's hard to find if you start talking about submission and you start talking about serving and you tar- start talking about stuff like that it can go uh, it can go to a place that it's not meant to go Remember in creation, what did the Bible say? It said that God created man out of the dust of the earth, right? And he said on, the, on that sixth day, he looked at Adam and he said, it is not good for the man to be alone, so he made him, made him a help meet for him. And so there was this service that was wired into your being to care, to idle, to take the earthquake, because you were going to have to help a guy. And the guy was going to be volatile sometimes because God, looking down through time, knew we were going to sin. But the point is, is that you're wired for this. And if you will embrace it in the way that you uh, are designed to do, you will find that good ground. When Jesus said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, he's talking about a yoke of service. And he's in one side of the yoke, and as a woman, you're in one side of the yoke. And if you go the way he goes, he says, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. The idea is it's serviceable. So if we go with what's serviceable, instead of thinking we need to compete with the boy, we need to uh, compliment the boy in the sense of complementarianism, where you basically are, you're, you're, you're completing him, you'll begin to realize a few things. And what I want to suggest in light of the fact that the price word has the idea of a dowry, as I want to remember, I want you to remember how men get down on their knees many times in years past and ages past more often than today. It meant something. Because the woman knew, because she had been properly trained to know this, that she was a prize to be won. She was not something to be scattered around. Uh, And a woman understood that if any man was going to take her hand in marriage, she was going to commit to him because uh, she thought, she, she counted him, listen, worthy. She counted him worthy. She thought of that. So the dowry there is there, but also the servant thing is there. And so let me just put it into a, a, a little bit of a paradigm that makes sense for me. So as a servant of God, you are a help meet. When it says help meet... It's M-E-E-T, okay, not M-E-A-T. You're not just chattel. You're not something to be owned. You're a help suitable. You are created suitably for the task that God has given you. And so if you take his yoke, his yoke will be easier than the other alternatives the world will try to give you. The other side of that coin is, is that I want you to know something else. You are a healer. You are a healer. When children are hurting, what are you like a nursing mother? You can't sleep. You're up and t- touching the back of their, uh, with your back of your hand, their head. You're checking their temperature. You're caring. Your husband's struggling, and he's going through life. Life is hard, guys. It is. It's hard because of sin. It's not hard because of design. God designed it good. And now it's a mess, and because it's a mess, we have to all take our position in the mess and try to figure out how to get through it, because we're not here forever. We're only here for a short time. And so what I say to you is her price, her price is far above rubies. She was bought with a price. The woman who is a virtuous woman is one who knows you were bought with a price, right? What was the price? Christ died for you. He died to redeem you from your sin, just as he died to redeem me from mine. 
And so when he gives his life for us, the price was worthy. He found it was worthy. And so he now enlists you in his service, puts things back to where they should have been as a help suitable for the guy and as a homemaker and a healer, bringing back what? What was lost. What are you a healer of? You're healer. You are a healer of society. You are the key to this thing. Because if the men go off the rails, what will the children do? We know there are whole cross sections of society where the fathers are absent in huge numbers. And more and more that's coming to be. More and more children are now being born in... I, I've, I've actually come to understand that it is more children are now born in single-parent homes than are born in married homes. This is the statistic. And part of the reason for that is because we've forgotten what design we were made for, what the, what the design was in original creation. And you're a healer. You can heal the nation. You can, in your own world. And when you begin to see it with spirit eyes, you can begin to look at your family with, uh, like somebody would look at, uh, maybe if you went and visited, let's say somebody who was shut in, couldn't do for themselves, you walked in with a view to, I'm going to go help them. The first thing you do is you roll up your sleeves and you pull back your hair, you put that pretty hair up in that little, you know, bun thing that you got, you know. And I've, I've seen a shirt some girl was wearing that says, uh, messy bun getting things done, okay? I don't know. I said, She's just going. And they're really in there. And that woman can't do for herself, right? So what are you doing? You're going to get in there with a mop and a bucket. And you're helping her because you are loving on her. And that's the way if you'll look at your family and your life and your homes as that is true, that there's a mess to be cleaned up. And you can clean up the guy and you can clean up the the kids. And when you do that, it's not for nothing. (laughs) It, it means the world, because all children are eternal. I know that when Ryan and Sammy look in their little baby's life, and I know that when Craig and Shannon looked in their baby's lives, the first thing that kind of hits you is that this is a human being, that they're really small and they're compact, and there's a whole world of, uh, 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 of um, uh, potential right there. It's a blank slate. And what you do with that is going to be dictated by how you see life. And the Bible says, who can find a virtuous woman? And, we, uh, uh, and our ladies need to aspire to be that virtuous woman, strong. Uh, know that you are a force. Know that as a price, uh, that you were bought with a price. And as a price, you're far above rubies. You were worthy of the dowry. And when we as men uh, solicited your favor, we did so advisedly. And you know, sometimes this world has foisted upon you the idea that if you aren't not, you know, drop-dead beautiful, that you're not a great person. I'll tell you what, some of the most beautiful people I've ever met are people who were just ordinary but had love of Jesus all over their face. That's what does it. That's what does it. It just sets your heart, it, it makes you want to sing. Life is not about the external, it's about the heart. And he says, who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. And I know in our generation, part of the problem with the, with the rarity now is because it's not being passed along how things were designed. So I want you to see your dignity under that heading of her price. You have great dignity. You, have, you are a force to be reckoned with. You are a force of nature. And if you uh, have the right values and the right plumb line and the right, uh, the right moorings in the Word of God, you will see the world with a sobriety and a clarity that will help you approach the duty of motherhood in a way that I think will uh, be a much more assimilated into your being without the resistance that is so natural to our being. Anytime we think we have to do something, right, right, do not touch wet paint. What? What? <laughs> wet paint. You know, we got to check it out. So if it says don't do it, we want to do it. And we have to realize, no, we're bought with a price. And as a result of that, we can be set free from our propensities. The Bible says in verse 11, it says, The heart of her husband doth safely trust in him, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Now, what we're seeing is her dignity in verse 1, because she's got a price and she's, a, she's rare in her, in her being and all of that. But here what we see is her directive. It is localized on the man. 
because it says the heart of her husband trusts in her. He will have no need of spoil. Do you know what spoil is? I know in our day we think of spoil. We think of, man, that stuff in the fridge has been there for a couple months. And I'm like, nah, I ain't touching it. You get it. You know, send the husband in, you know. That's spoilage. No, spoil means when the battles were won, he would go out, fight a battle, and he would win something, and he would get to strip the, uh, the, 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 the valuables off of the body of the one that he conquered. Okay, he's like thinking, i got to go conquer something. But because she is to him that help meet, the one who smiles for him when he's struggling, the one who... Uh, gets under and, you know, kind of soldiers on and helps him through the hard times, as well as the children, but for the husband in the focus here, she begins to realize, or he begins to realize, there's the good stuff. When I look at her, she's smiling at me. (laughs) And I'm okay. This is where the jewel is. This is the smile that I live for. Now, this is huge, guys. If you want to go back into the novels, the greatest novels, the greatest love stories, it's all about the woman buoyancy, the, the vivacious life that's there, the laughter, the spinning around. Look at my dress flowing up. Guys are fascinated by women. Women are not fascinated by guys in that way. Years and years ago, men used to be necessary for women. They needed them to protect them and to provide for them. The world was a more hostile place. But now it's all gone haywire. The apple cart's been turned over, and you don't need men anymore. Not like you once did. The government will pay you not to marry, okay? It'll it'll pay you for having another couple of kids. You see, you are up against it. And the world would whisper in your ear, leave, fly, go, run, give it, you know, throw him under the bus, give it up, quit, lay down, give up. But the fact of the matter is, is that a virtuous woman realizes with clarity in her eyes that she's been bought with a price and she's on on call for God and that she was worthy of the dowry uh, that she would have been paid for her hand, if you will. When the man reached out and said, will you marry me? That was saying, I see something in you that just blows me away. Now, whether he has those words after a couple months, I know the guy, one guy said, what do you mean? You want me to tell you I love you? I told you I love you once. If I change my mind, I'll send you an email. And, you know, they don't want to say I love you all the time. It's a crazy day, isn't it? We need to be much about the girl, guys, because they are idling on levels that we have no idea about. They are struggling today against a whirlwind of whispers that say, do something other than what God would have them do. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, and he will have no need of spoil because he's got the girl that sees her role as being a a, a lifter up, a healer, a helper, and one who would be like a cheerleader. Uh, the, The words here also goes further for it. It says, she will do him good and not evil. The word for good means she will treat him good. She will benefit him, if you will, all her days. She, it says down in verse 16, as it goes through, in, as, as it unfolds for us, we see her doing a lot of stuff, but I won't jump to 16 yet. Look at verse 3, it says, uh, uh, or I'm sorry, verse um, uh, 10, 11, 12, 12, verse 12. The Bible says, she will do him good, and not evil, all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax... And worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ships, and she bringeth her food from afar. And if you get bogged down into the uh, minutia of this, and you begin to make it really rigid, you're going to think, well, that means I need to be working, I need to be doing this, and I need to be doing that, I need to be investing, I need to go far and get my food. It's not really trying to make that point. It's really amplifying what it says she will do him good and not evil all the day of, uh, of her life. In other words, what she's going to do is she's going to make him safely trust in her by being a person who seeks to flourish the household. Two words keep coming up in both sections at the beginning and the end, and it's the word household. Look at it in verse 15. And she giveth meat to her household and her husband in verse 11. She begins to realize the household and her husband are paramount to her calling from God. And what you see is you see that she's, when it says she work, uh, she seeketh wool and flax uh, and worketh willingly with her hands, uh, the words for wool and flax have the idea, uh, flax is not food, it's, it's about clothing. Wool, about, obviously, is about clothing. She worries about how everybody's clothed. Ultimately, what she's going to try to seek in her family is that her family would be clothed in scarlet. 
It talks about her uh, clothing her her children in scarlet. Uh, If you look into it, let me see if I can find it for you for a moment here. It says, she seeketh wool, verse 13, uh, and flax. It goes on down and it says she uh, she clothes her house in scarlet in verse 21. There it is. It says she's not afraid of the snow for her household uh, because her household are clothed with scarlet. Do you know what scarlet is? That's red, right? Why are they clothed in red? Because they're saved. <laughs> she, she's clothed her. She's done everything she can to facilitate the reality of redemption in her home. She's going to help her kids get to glory one day. She's not going to go, you know, fan the flame of every other little, you know, butterfly that the world throws at him. It's not all about sports and it's not all about music and it's not all about playing and it's not all about performing and it's not all about... See, those are things that are fine in their own right. But the first number one thing she wants to know is, are my kids clothed with scarlet? Is my husband clothed with scarlet? Because that's what she can do. It is an amazing thing. I wish I could go deeply and plumb the hearts of women and really find out what it is that they struggle with at the at the core of their life. If I were to postulate, which I hesitate to do, but if I were, I I just think it's that they're worried a lot about everything. If there was one thing that really plagued them, it, it might be that they were worried for their kids, worried for their husband, worried, worried. Why? Because the world is broken and the kids are vulnerable and you pour your heart into them. And if they do not make it home one day, the alternative is huge. Huge. You've lost that person for eternity. So we try to clothe them in scarlet. We put them before the word of God. We bring them along in the things of God. Uh, The Bible says, and in her directive, she would therefore have a husband who would have no need of spoil because she would protect him from all of the things that would draw him away from her and away from home. Uh, She's virtuous as a force to be reckoned with. She she is a person who ultimately goes for this flax and this wool, and she's trying to clothe her house, and she's starting with what she has to work with. You remember the whole thing about the calendar, the first year, what is it? Paper is the anniversary paper, and then it gets to cotton, and eventually it's silver and gold. Man, you start out with paper. You start out with flax and wool. Eventually, you get to scarlet. You get to purple. Well, what we see in this passage beyond that is I want to punctuate for us. It says in verse 14, she's like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. She riseth while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. Now we see food and we see meat. These are things that are nourishing. Verse 16, she considers a a field and buyeth it and the fruit of her hands, uh, with the fruit of her hands, she planteth a vineyard. Now, what we're seeing is she's starting with going out and figuring life out. You know, she's got the, and it ultimately culminates in becoming uh, the provision of a vineyard. Now, vineyards were very interesting. For many of us, we want to go quickly to the idea of wine, but really, vineyards are a wonderful thing in their own right. If you like grapes at all, they're awesome. And if you like raisins at all, they're awesome. But if some folks, just they only hear one thing. But what he's saying is, is that the apogee of her work has become that which brought forth grapes, which were luscious. Think of a day when there was no candy. I know. Don't get sad. We're going to move from this in a moment, okay? In fact, I'm going to give you some candy at the end of our time together this morning as moms, okay? We're going to make this all better. But imagine a world where there was no pop, no soda pop, no iced tea, things like that. They had water. They had milk. They had no refrigeration. So you didn't even have cold water unless you had a good solid well that was deep. Basically, what I'm saying is, is that the vineyard provided... A, a, a grape juice that was uh, succulent. I mean, you know, when we uh, celebrate the Lord's Supper, we take the bread and our mouths are made dry by the reality of it, right? We remember he's broken body. But then we take the cup and we have grape juice. And it is so good at that point when we've already dried out our palate after having sat for a while. And then you drink that cup and you remember he shed his blood. And you remember that the cup was always a symbol of joy. It was the apogee and what women can do is they can cultivate a world around themselves that is a joy for everyone in the room. The Bible says, A garden enclosed is my sister, my spouse, because she becomes the one who becomes the spoil to me, but also 
Uh, there's the fact that she provides for her kids some wonderful things. Uh, Kenny used to tell me when he would come home as a little boy and his mom was uh, home during the day working, he said she'd make up a bunch of cookies. And she said, I'm just going to wear you guys out. We're making cookies today, and you guys are going to be so sick of cookies. She finally gave up. Those boys just kept eating the cookies. It was a good day. And see, our moms make our lives delightful. What they will do is they'll put pretty pictures on the wall, and they'll, they'll put, uh, you know, neat foods. They'll say, what is his favorite food? What is her favorite food? They'll make that meal for you, and, and they will be thoughtful toward you. And if you're a woman, and your mother is doing something like that for you, it blows you away, because nobody thinks about you like your mom thinks of you. <laughs> when you're sick, you don't want your husband. You want your mom. Even if you're married, you need mom. Where's mom? Why? Because we understand that women are healers. Women are givers. Women are lovers. They're the ones that make the world beautiful. And God meant it to be so. It says, she riseth while it is yet night, verse 15. It talks about she considers a field and buyeth it. It says that she, uh, she brings forth fruit and uh, the fruit of her hands in verse uh, 16 uh, she plants up with the fruit of her hands she plants a vineyard so she's she's cultivated beyond the basics up to a place of real blessing to everyone in her home it says in verse 17 that she girds her loins with strength and uh, strengtheneth her arms in other words here's a woman when it says girdeth you know obviously i'm thinking in our day everybody's at the gym right it's like oh man I'm pumps some iron, you know. You know, guys, just so you all know, guys like their girls soft. <laughs> so it's okay to pump iron, but just don't be like some of those pictures I've seen on some of those magazines where the girls would scare me, you know. <laughs> like, I'm like, wait, you're trying to embarrass me? All right, mission accomplished, <laughs> okay, because they've got, you know, they got the muzzles. But when it says girded her, it's not talking about working out. It's talking about a woman who understands what she's got to do as a woman who's a virtuous woman. She sees with her eyes, and she begins to attack that thing, does everything she can to compliment. If you're going to be a contender, uh, let's say a, a, a long-run runner, you know, a long-range runner, um, and, and you're, you're going to be in track and field, you don't do things that, that, that get your arms going for, the, you know, for throwing the javelin or shot put. You're working your legs out. You're working your wind out. And what she's doing is because she sees things and she understands that she is a force, she begins to strengthen her arms. She begins to take and make her loins and her arms to be strengthened. Why? Because she's on task for her Lord. You see, your husband is not your Lord. Jesus is your Lord. <laughs> okay. Uh, although Sarah did honor Abraham by calling him Lord, he's not your Lord. Jesus is your Lord. And you're serving him. And this is why she has a price. She's been bought. She's put into the realm. And she, her, her, her price was something a man saw, but also God saw. Now, we've seen her price. Look at her perception. It says in verse, uh, verse 18, it says, She perceiveth... That her merchandise is good. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Now that word merchandise, if you circled that and drew a light line up to the word price, you could see that these two words actually are connected in their root meanings. Her price, because she was bought, right? She was bought with a pri her price. And her merchandise, the merchandise of herself, you perceive that your merchandise is good. You are good, okay? And we guys know it. We just have a hard time telling you because we don't want to go to your head. <clears throat> we know you're good. You're good for us. You're good to us. You're good to be around. We like it that you like us, okay? We do. And if you don't like us, we're really struggling all the time. Titus chapter 2 talks about the older women teaching the younger women. And one of the things it says was that the older women were to teach the younger women to love their husband. Now, that sounds very interesting on the surface. Oh, okay, i got to love my husband. I, I, I want you to know it doesn't mean love like it means when husbands love your wives. When it says husbands love your wives, that word means that you're supposed to sacrifice for your wife. Do that. What it means for the woman to love her husband, it it's means to be fond of him and like him. Now, that's harder. 
because you can love him. I'm going to make his food. You can love him. I'm going to make the bed. You can love him. You're going to do his laundry. But you might not like him very much. But the Bible says you tell them women. They need to like their husbands. Listen, and let them tell them to like their children. Now, a lot of women think, well, I didn't have that special gene. <laughs> I didn't have that special gene. I thought when you got a child, you were supposed to like this kid. But I'm like, this is kind of freaking me out. Do you know what's happened? Is that we've been taught to be all about ourselves. So it, it's already been short-circuited out of the gate. But if you will allow yourself to like that child and like that husband, you will begin to have a little bit more lift in your soul. And when it says that she perceives that her merchandise is good. She realizes she is the center. You know you are. You're the center of the home. Without you, there would be no home. I was hitting doors some time ago, and I went up to these apartments. And I think they might be the apartments that one of our gals back here lives in. I hit this door. Knock, knock. Hey, how are you guys doing? The door opened. I'm not kidding you. There was two guys in there. They had big dark blankets over top of the windows. One guy was on a computer playing a video game over here. The other guy was uh, uh, on his TV playing a video game over here. There was empty boxes of pizza. There was stuff strewn through the room. And that was, that was their home. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, boys, get a shower. Go outside. There's girls out there. You know what I'm saying? There's girls. Go get a girl, you know? She'll make you a better guy. She'll make you a better guy. Write a name down for me, would you? His name is George Gilder. He wrote a book called Men in Marriage as a sociologist who was unsaved. And he showed what happened when the women uh, no longer domesticated the men. He got saved later. George Gilder. Men in marriage. It's a great read for you ladies because you need to realize your merchandise is good. Your merchandise is good. And therefore her candle goeth not out by night, verse 18. She's not looking at the, uh, the, the, you know, the pebbles and the cracks in the road in front of her. She's looking at the long picture. She's seeing her family as a commission of God. And she's seeing it as uh, understanding she's been bought with a price. Understanding that she can make an impact that will last for eternity and impact eternity. So she perceives her merchandise as good. I've got power. I'm a force to be reckoned with. And I can, uh, I can impact my kids and my husband in a way that, wakes, that makes a big deal, a uh, big deal of difference. Verse uh, 19 says, She layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. I go back to the word flax and wool a moment ago, because what it's saying is she's still knitting together a world in that home. It's not about you have to know how to sew. My wife doesn't like to sew. There's very few things my wife doesn't like to do. I really did hit the jackpot. She's not here. She'd be mad at me if I told you this, but I love my wife. I'm glad she likes me most of the time. <laughs> you know, this is life. I'm a hard guy to get along with sometimes, but she loves me. She likes me too. And my point is this, is that she doesn't like to sew and she doesn't like to dust. And I, and I love her anyway. Okay, <laughs> she'll do those things, but she doesn't like to do them. And she'll hem some things if I need them hemmed. And what I'm saying is, is it's in, when she reads this, sometimes getting caught in the minutia, she's thinking, well, is there something wrong with me? I don't, I don't like to dust and I don't like to sew. No, 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 no. It's not about that. You're weaving, you're, you're knitting, you're, you're, you're sewing, you're putting together something that is huge. The word sewing is used throughout this. It talks about that wool, that flax. It talks about the fact that she is setting her hand to the distaff. She's not letting her light go out by night in verse 18. She's, she's getting her hand to the spindle verse 19. Her hands hold the distaff. That talks about that. It says she stretches out her hand. Hand, hand keeps coming out. She reaches forth her hands to the needy. All of that is emblematic of what this, this, this knitting she's doing. You know, women, not only this, cra this crazy stuff, they care for us guys, and then they turn around and care for those kids, and used to it be like 10, 12 kids, and then they'll go talk to somebody who needs something across the way. They made pie for somebody who's sick. They went and visited Miss Mabel, who was laid off. They're like, wait a minute. And then they had to take the kids with them because they couldn't leave the littlest ones with the older ones who were watching some of the ones. They had kids, and they were still caring. Why? Because they did not let their light go out. They realized they were a force of nature, and they realized that they could impact people and realities for eternity. You can do that. You are good. You're in merchandise. This is her perception. She sees it. I can do good stuff. And it's amazing what you can do. 
And yes, we do marvel at you. In fact, you make us look so bad sometimes <laughs> because you're so good. I'm a pastor. I got a wife who makes me look terrible. She's so good. I'm not kidding. I just want you to know this is the way of it. And as a person of humble spirit, which you have a natural propensity to have, if you go there, you can get under and you can help, you can equip, you can buoy up, and you can get us all through this thing. It's almost like you've got the wheelbarrow and you're carrying us. Yeah, the guy goes get the money and he brings it home. Yeah, the guy goes out and protects you from the bad guys out there. But you guys are the heart. Now, this is powerful because if you look at the, uh, the significance of it, in the garden, the woman was the one that started the chain of reactions. And God has, he knew how powerful you were. The, dead, the devil did too. Do you know he didn't come to Adam and say, you will be like God. He went to the woman and said, you will be like God. Why? Because the man would worship and serve the creature rather than the creator. And that's what Adam did when he took of the tree. And what we're seeing is, is we're seeing that when she realizes how powerful she is and what a force she is, she realizes she can be a head turner for God or a head turner for herself. And if she's on the virtuous side, she's going to turn heads for God. Oh, the Bible tells us in this passage, as the virtuous woman is set forth, that she stretcheth forth her hand to the poor in verse 20. What do you got time for that? Sometimes I come home, and I'm just going to give you a little lucidity here, a little personal glimpse into my world. We support several missionaries, but I worry every time a new solicitation comes because Linda will pick that baby up and say, let's write a check for them. And I'm like, man, we're all, we got six already. Come on, we need seven? Oh, yeah, it's a perfect number. So she talks me into it. Next thing you know, we're supporting another thing for another, you know, another time. And it's hard to break off once you start supporting. You get more letters for more support. Why? Because she's stretching forth because she cares. Men don't care like that. We want to know all the facts, man. We want to know where's that check going and what's getting done, man. She's like, oh, man. We had a kid come to our house recently that she had a little investment in in his childhood. He came to our house. He said, hey, I'm in town. I'm back from Florida and I don't have any money for gas. I just took a little silent, deep breath. What'd you do? I gave him $20. I said, you what? No, I didn't say that. I knew she gave him money. He came back three days later, and he wanted some more. And she said, I'll give him it out of my money. I said, listen, I said, I know you, but I know that boy too. And I said, you need me now, <laughs> you know, because this could get carried away. You see my point? I'm trying to make the point. Girls, you're good. Your merchandise is good. You're awesome. You care. You will feel like men won't. And you do need us to kind of rein you in a little bit because that feeler can get out of control. However, however, you're awesome to us. Can I say that? You're awesome to us. And your perception is good if you have that discernment that your merchandise is good. You understand that. You understand that you're spinning and you're providing. And you've got silk, it mentions in this passage, verses 18 to 20. It talks about silk. And it talks about girding them with scar scarlet. It comes on down, um, down to verse 25. I'm thinking it's where it's put in there. Uh, she, no, verse 24. It says, she maketh fine linen. You know what that is? That's a very tight woven thing, right? You ever heard that on those, those commercials? They say the, this has got so many, what is it? So many stitches or whatever it is. You know what I'm talking about. So many stitches in this. This is really tight. You're, 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 you're really, really working it, okay? You're building a home. You're building a life. You're building a family. But it goes beyond that. She's got so much energy. <sighs> it blows us away because you do. If she's got so much energy that she not only does this knitting of this fine linen, but it says, and she delivereth girdles unto the merchant. She actually takes what she's got and she turns it over to other people. And when it talks about her merchandise, she's saying, I realize that what I have, I can give away. What that means is she puts it into the marketplace of life. Her efforts of loving and caring is put into circulation. When other women see you, you know, out there serving, loving, caring, and condescending, and getting under. We had a lady, her name was Beth Thompson. This lady was the sweetest lady you ever knew. And I did not know something about her until after she, dead, she died. She literally would go around the highways and byways of the hills of, West, uh, of Virginia, where we were living, and she would take and she would uh, groom uh, older women who were shut in, in homes that were so disgusting because they were so lost. But she didn't go in there to clean their house. She went in there to, to, to pamper the, the women. 
She would do their, their nails. She would do their little toenails. And you know, when you get older sometimes, that's, that's not a very happy job. She would go and she would file their nails and she would comb their hair and she would sit and talk with them. And she would do this out of the love of her heart. You see, years ago when things weren't so crazy, women had temperance societies, missionary societies. They would lead the charge in, in helping the society bring things into the world like temperance. Remember the, uh, the prohibition? Women were a large part of that getting the men not to be drinking, because they needed their men to be on task, not out drinking, okay? Somebody said, well, God doesn't turn water to wine anymore. No, he turns wine into food and clothes and, and furniture. <laughs> he saves people from the nonsense of alcohol. But what I'm saying is, is that she was that kind of woman, and women have that propensity to care. But what the devil does is he tries to neutralize every one of us where, we, where he finds us. And because you are so strong in so many ways, the devil would harness the strength that you represent and put it somewhere else. Think about that, and I'll say no more about it. But he'll try to get you to put it somewhere else. You've got fine linen. You're going to put the girdles, uh, you're going to deliver girdles uh, unto the merchant. And the idea there is that she's putting it into circulation. Verse 25, it says, Strength and honor uh, are her clothing. And there's a lot of neat things about these words I won't go into, but it says, And she shall rejoice, look at this, in time to come. She talks about not being afraid of the snow in verse 21. That's the time when everything is laying fallow, when everything is kind of hard and barren. She's not afraid of that because she's a woman who in verse 25 is already preparing for the time to come. And she's clothed her children in scarlet and she knows they need to go to heaven. And there's only one other alternative and that's unthinkable. She's got to do what she's got to do to knit that family together, pour Jesus into those kids and lift them up uh, through this quagmire. And you ever seen maybe a child being held by an arm and the guy is dying, you know, trying to hold his kid maybe in some of these flood pictures you see in the old days back there where they would depict the flood. The Aaron is holding the child up above the water. Do you know we're in a flood situation down here? <laughs> the septic tanks have been pouring into the streets. It's been pouring into the media. It's been pouring into the world. And your child needs you and me to hold them up, don't, don't they? Because that's what a mother does. And she shall rejoice in time to come. What a neat thing to see our child across the halls of heaven run and hug and say, Honey, we made it. We used to sing, Will the circle be unbroken by and by, Lord, by and by. I'm telling you, that's the hope of every mother who looks at it with clear eyes. So we see her perception, and she's prepared for time to come. And look at her praise. Yeah, look at her praise. Verse 26 says, She openeth her mouth with wisdom, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. You know, women have a, a, verb, a, a, a verbal ability men don't have. When boys are on the playground, they're going, vroom, vroom, pow, pow, pow. Linda made a noise the other day, and it sounded like a little buzz. You know, she said, I have one of these little, uh, she uses it for something other than this, but a jewelry cleaner, and they just buzz. And she made, I said, did you just make a noise like a buzz? I said, that sounded real. She said, I know, I did that really good, didn't I? That's a guy thing, man. We're like making gun sounds and explosions. And the, but girls on the same playground will be walking around talking, oh, yeah, Bobby and Belly and Jill and Jam, and, you know, we're doing this, and the teacher and Mommy, and we made, we made cookies. And the guys are like, and we want to shoot them. Be quiet. Whatever. And as you get older, because you practice more, you get better at it. You learn to rein it in, and you open your mouth in a way that is decidedly virtuous. And what is that way? She openeth her mouth with wisdom. In her tongue is the law of kindness. Why this is so important, guys, is because you're better at it than we are. Donald Trump was noted to say down at the Liberty University um, lecture here recently, he did the commencement address. He said, crit crit being a critic is easy and it's pathetic. Now, of course, that's a backhanded slap at the media. They're hard on him in many ways that no other, no other president has ever had to face. But think about that. Being a critic is easy, and it's pathetic. Is it true? Kind of is. Even if it does serve him to say it, it's kind of true. But let me tell you something, a little secret. I'm 56, so I can tell you this from my own perspective. It is easy for me to be critical as a man. And I'm thankful my wife sometimes says, let's not go there. 
because she can. She can pull me back and I won't go into that place that my heart wants to go. I'm a man. I have disappointments in life, as every man does and will at one time. I've had people tell me, I would have been this, I would have been that, and then I got married. And they're like, they're looking at their wives as if they're the problem. They're not the problem. Life is hard. Life is hard. And as men, it gets all over us because as we get older, we think, am I going to be able to provide? Am I going to be able to be strong? Am I going to be able to do? And as women, when you have the law of kindness knit into your fabric and you're not critical and you begin to open your mouth with wisdom, you begin to breathe new life back into us. My dad was a very critical guy. Everything he would say as we were growing up was hard, to, hard not to you know, assimilate because we're like our parents. And so I had a little dose of it, and, I, and my wife helps me with that. And you can help your husband and your children with that as well. And so if you're critical, fellas, let your wife help you with that. Or if you're critical, ladies, kind of rein that in. She opened her, her mouth with wisdom, and her tongue, and in her tongue is the law of kindness. Look at this, verse 27, almost as a summary statement. She looketh well to the ways of her household. She eateth not of the bread of idleness. Uh, idleness is the alternative. Idleness is the alternative. If a, if a woman doesn't dig down and do it God's way, they're going to be busy with idleness. If you remember in the book of uh, 1 Timothy in chapter 5, it talks about widows and widows indeed and the younger widows. It says the younger widows, when they are not working, many times will become busybodies and gossips. They need to go get married because when they're married, they care about their family and they're not going to hurt them. It's an interesting caveat, but women have a lot going on in their mind. This is what's freaky, you know? This is what's freaky to us guys. We got one compartment, maybe two at best. If those two compartments are full, don't even ask us to chew a piece of gum because we're going to fall down. It's not going to happen. Women got six compartments. Six, seven, eight, ten, twelve. I don't know. Many of you guys are crazy, man. You got nuts going on. It's crazy stuff, okay? We're just blown away by what you can do. You can be having a conversation with me and know what three other people at other tables can know. What, you'll know what they're saying. We can't even hear you, and we're looking you in the eye. So come on. So this is the world, and this is the wiring. She looketh well to the ways of her household. And, and what she does is she doesn't go to the bread of idleness because what happens is, is she begins to realize, i got something to do when i got kids. i got something to do when i got a husband. I'm a virtuous woman. I've got the clarity, and I'm going in for Jesus. I've been bought with a price. I'm going to serve God and glorify God in my body. And I'm going to love on my kids, and I'm going to smile at them when I look at them. I've heard women tell me, you know, I wish I would have heard, I wish I would have smiled at my children more. Isn't that a powerful word? Isn't it easy to get disgusted or angry? They make you angry, man. They're they're crimping your style, you know, as we get along. And no, you got to just smile at them. Smile at them because you are the face of grace to them. Men are the face of the law. Man, they walk in, the kids straighten up. We're in my back in, back there in my Sunday school class, little Dayton's sitting on, on, on Shannon's lap. I'm not kidding you. I don't care what that kid's doing. When we're in there, he's tracking on me. It's like, I guess I'm the biggest voice he hears aside from his dad. His dad's got a booming voice, but he looks at me because I'm booming. He's like, oh, what's going on, you know? <laughs> got to make sure I know where that's at at all moments, you know? That might hurt me. But he, he smiles sometimes. He's trying to make nice. See, I got him making nice because he's smiling at me, my little grandbaby. What am I saying? That she understands some stuff because she's got perception. And her praise comes from having done this. The Bible says she looks well to the ways of, of her household. It says she eateth not the bread of idleness. Verse, 30, uh, verse 28 says her children arise up and call her blessed. The word blessed has the idea of being happy ultimately. But it has the idea also of being straight, being right, being level, being honest. You're not lying to your children. You're telling them how it is by showing them how it is. You're loving them because you're telling them, I'm willing to make this sacrifice like Jesus made for me. I'm going to serve in this capacity because I've been wired to be able to do so. And ultimately, it has the idea of being straight and right, and the kids will rise up and call her blessed. Now, that's a big deal because kids today don't always know what they're getting until they're older. But when you get that phone call at age 23, 24, 25, and it says something, you know, uh, you know, that's like, Mom, you know, I just never knew how much you meant to me and what you did for me. That blows you away. Those are, those are things you live for. 
But if you do it for Christ's sake, it's going to be more meaningful than ever. It's not just going to be said because you had to get a card and you had to put down five because you couldn't say this and you couldn't say that. Have you ever been there where you're like, oh, i got to get a card for this. Oh, I can't write that. Ain't true. Ain't true. I see people doing that all the time. They're going through they got 15 cards. Some of the most flower ones, they get the one that says, happy day. And that's about, it. You know, that's about all they got. That's about all they got. Oh, beloved, we don't want to be that person. We want to pour into our kids for Jesus' sake. And ladies, you have such a power, such a force. You're such a force to be reckoned with. It says, many daughters, verse 29 says, many daughters. Oh, and it says, and her husband and, uh, also will rise up and call her blessed. And he praiseth her. Now, this word praise literally has the idea of raving, almost being like a foolishness. And I hope that maybe you see that in me with my wife. You see, I can't give her the moon. But I can gush over how much she's so good. And she is. She blows me away. She's not perfect. I can't say she's perfect. I know her. She's not. But she's pretty near close in my eyes. Very hard for me to, to be too harsh on her. If she messes up, I just want to say, don't worry about it. We'll get through that. You know, I just want to help her because she's done so much for me. Ladies, you are a force to be reckoned with. Just pour it out there. Let it be Jesus that takes care of the results. And it says her, her children will rise up, and he and her husband also. They're going to call her blessed. Her husband's going to praise her. Many daughters have, ex- have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful. That word literally has the idea of lies. Favor lies. And the word favor has the idea of how you get doors opened up to you and, and people are nice to you because you're a lady. You know, it used to be more so. But in our day, I opened the door for a girl the other day and she just went on through and didn't even say anything. You know, and that kind of hurts my feelings. But, you know, I'm still going to open the door. Sometimes I'll open the door for people to look at me surprised. Oh, really? You know, really? They're looking at me surprised. What? They say, ladies first. You go first. Why? Because that's the way I'm trained in my DNA to care and to cultivate that gentlemanly thing and try to be a nice guy for for ladies. He says, but a woman, it says, beauty is is vain. That literally has the idea of it being, uh, uh, what was the word, empty and transitory. It won't last. And we understand we're preparing for the end days. Uh, We're trying to prepare for eternity. So use it. She understands her merchandise is good. And that goes back to that. And verse 31 says, give her the fruit of her hand. In other words, go ahead and tell her you love her. Tell her she's good. Tell her you're you're, you're amazed by her. There's a country song. Baby, I'm amazed by you. And that's a true song. Guys are. That's why we listen to that. I bet. Repeat that. Yeah, I want to hear that again. And if we guys might have been saying it more, maybe they wouldn't need to hear it the second, third time. I'll tell you what, next time that comes on in the car, guys, if you're listening to that station, you just turn that thing off and you just sing it. Belt it out. I don't care if you can carry a tune or not. She'll love it. (laughs) For a couple seconds, if you can't sing. Just that. Don't don't overdo it. All right. Let her own works praise her in the gates. Why? Because she deserves it. She deserves praise. And I just want to say to you ladies, there are countries right now going down the tubes because there are women who are decidedly being deceived. Merkel in, in Germany has opened up the gates because she's in charge of the country, right? Why does she do that? Because she's a woman and she wants to have this caring thing. Now, that may be part of it. I think there's a little bit more than that. But she's a gal. You look at Sweden. used to be the best place to live in the world. Now it's the rape capital of the world. Why? Because the ladies are in control and they're all working with their feelings. They're not going by their minds. Use your perception. See it for what it is. Have the clarity and make decisions based upon what is right, true, and good. Because we need you to do that. Not just because you need to do it, but... Because we need you to do it. And we need you to take your girdles and sell them to the other girls. Okay? Because I can't tell women what you can tell other women. When older women teach younger women, this is huge. Song of Solomon is your tutorial for your daughter. Uh, It's your tutorial for your girlfriend. It's your tutorial for people that you know will listen to you. The world in which we live, and, and by the way, the theme of Song of Solomon, awake not your love till it's time. This is a big thing today. The love is getting woken up way before the marriage vows are made, right? And what's happening is the whole world's falling in on itself. And I just want you to know, you guys are a force to be reckoned with. Don't ever sell your short, yourself short. Understand that you can impact time and eternity because God has designed you to have that ability to help. You're a suitably created help, and you have the ability to heal. 
And I just want to appeal to you to do that. If you've noticed, there's more women on TV than ever in the news media. More women are involved in the, in the polit political world. And we're looking at a world where the women are becoming more and more prominent. And the men are taking a back seat. This is something we have to decidedly say, I'm going to do this thing God's way, the best of my ability, and work with what you got to work with. Be a healer. Be a helper. And be a servant of the Lord Jesus. I hope that's helpful for you. And remember, remember, thrift is good. Billy Bob died. Red truck for sale. Okay? Just saying. Would you bow with me for a moment?